the Canadian immigration lawyer, and this is another edition of our Express Entry Live Q&A, with a little bit of help with all of the other areas of immigration. All right. Well, welcome back, everybody, to another round of Canadian immigration here. Oh, well, let's see here. We're going to stop here. Okay, I got, I've got a bunch of things going on in the background. So welcome back to another Q&A. And uh, today what we're going to talk about, I've got a little bit of news. Um, uh, we'll start off with that, and then I'm going to dive in answering listener questions as always. Uh, there's lots going on with immigration. We're starting to see some positive movement with the permanent resident applications. We're starting to see spousal sponsorships getting processed really quickly. In Canada, PNPs going fairly quickly. I just had my last, oh, my last client from the previous firm that I worked at over three years ago. Finally, we got a passport request. So it's absolutely crazy to think it has been over almost five years since we submitted that Saskatchewan immigrant nominee program paper-based application. They just got the passport request and lots can change in that short period of time, can't it? So I'll turn up my audio here so you guys can hear me a little bit better. Um, so yes, it's welcome. Welcome everybody. Make sure that you post in the comments below where you're tuning in from. Um, yeah, this is a uh, this is our, our weekly little endeavor that we do every Wednesday morning at uh, 10 a.m. Mountain Time. So please give me a shout out. Let's see who we've got here. We've got Lima who's over in Quebec. Good to see you. We've got uh, Ibrian, who's down in Chicago. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, those of you who have questions, we'll definitely get to those questions. And uh, there's a lot. Yeah, there's a there's a lot that we're going to cover in these live Q and A's. And I don't know. There's not too many people I think out there, uh, at least immigration lawyers, that take the time to do this. But it's our way of giving back. And we are posting here on YouTube. Some are watching on Twitter, which I now realize. We have uh, Facebook. Yogesh, good to see you over on the Canadian Immigration Institute Facebook page. Good to have you. Raya is over in India. Superman from Ontario, good to have you here connecting in. Uh, Fayaz is in Brampton. Hello, Fayaz. Taj over in Nigeria, welcome. We've got our Africa representation. Amanvir, good to see you, Amanvir. Let us know where you're tuning in from. And, uh, and, uh, monsoon says from Churchill. No, I think that's, is that Manitoba, uh, monsoon? We'll, we'll see. Um, uh, Simran is over in Vancouver and, uh, Cher says, talk about the express entry draw. Yes, I absolutely will. There's no doubt about that. We will, we will absolutely talk about, uh, the, the express entry draws and what's happening. Um, it's interesting as we, you know, Alicia and I last week talked a lot about the, uh, the fact that express entry, um, the government is has been inviting a lot of people, right, in the rounds of invitations. And just last week, they did two back-to-back -back draws. So, you know, realistically, we, I, I remember last week I said, no, I don't think they're going to do it. And they did. And I don't know who it was of you guys that said, I've got a feeling that they're going to do something. Well, you own up to it and I'll give you a round of applause because you apparently were in sync with this uh, fine minister here, Minister Fraser. So uh, if it was you who, who had who had guessed that there was going to be a draw, I'll give you a shout out because that was awesome. And really, they, it seems like they're back on track to some extent. They've sorted out all the problems with the new tier rollover to the NOC 2021 and the five-digit code. It seems like they've kind of sorted that out, but it is an ongoing source of stress and pain, isn't it, for everybody? Okay, Monsoon says, yes, Manitoba. So Churchill, great to have you here. Ali, good morning to you. And Gatita, hey, good to see you. Ramit over in India watching at, what is it, just about, you know, it's after 10.30 p.m. I think there, isn't it, Ramit? So thanks so much for uh, for connecting in. Ravi says, will there be a draw today? I'm going to say no. <laughs> just like I said no last week. But I'm going to say no this week, and I'm going to say that probably they're going to get back into the schedule of doing it every other week. But who the heck knows? I don't know. I'm not in the mind of Minister Fraser. I'm definitely not. So um, anything can happen. Anything is possible. All right, let's give some more shout outs here. So we've got uh, uh, Cantona 
great over in Accra, Ghana. You know what? I've got two really, really good friends that are over in Ghana. Um, they're serving a mission for our church. I think they're in Accra right now and uh, just really, really good friends. And, and they're, um, they're a couple. Their kids have all uh, left the house. They're all married and, and uh, they're retired. And they went over to, to Accra to, to serve a mission for our church. So Cantona, if you see, <clears throat> if you see the whites over there, please <laughs> say hello. <laughs> all right. Um, Lima, good to see you. Hello. And good morning to you, um, Genio1982. Great. We've got Gatita over in Saskatoon. Excellent. And uh, Genio is in India. Great to have you here. Uh, let's see. And we'll get to all the questions. We definitely will. Those of you guys who are putting it, uh, who, who are posting questions now. Nisha over in Toronto. Great to have you here. And uh, oh, what do we have here? We celebrate this, don't we, Julianne? She says, I got my invitation to the PR portal yesterday thanks to your TR to PR Pathway course. Thank you so much. Couldn't be happier. Keep up the amazing work. I will give you a round of applause there. That's kind of a quiet round of applause. Let's let's ramp it up a bit. Let's see if we can get it a little bit louder here. There we go. That's better. <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> That's so, so awesome. And what Julianne is referring to back in 2021 when they when they launched it, um, I launched my TR to PR pathway course. And I'll probably have to log in here to my account to get it because it's obviously no longer available because the program closed. But it was this one here, the TR to PR pathway course. And um, there were a ton of people that subscribed to that course at that time. And it was kind of rough and tumble and we were building things out on the fly. And uh, yeah, in this course with all of the modules and how to prepare all of the different sections and yeah, everything in here, this is this is how we run it here at the Canadian Immigration Institute. And so that course, um, the TR to PR Pathway course, the people that subscribe to it, many of them who were following right at the very beginning of that process. Um, and I suspect, Julianne, that you probably... Um, got the course a little bit later or you filed a little bit later. Maybe you were French or maybe you were going through uh, one of the essential worker uh, categories. I'm not sure. But boy, the international grads who went through, um, who took the course, almost all of them were had their applications approved and, uh, and um, you know, they were permanent residents in some of them in as little as three weeks. That's how fast. But it was because they got in first I taught them how to do everything that they needed to do uh, within the course. I showed them exactly what the portal was going to look like before it went live to everyone else. And uh, and ultimately, they were so prepped up for it. So um, to see that people are continuing to get their TR to PRs approved just really, really makes me um, feel like I'm doing something worthwhile. And uh, it's great, great to have that very positive news. Um, just so you guys know, as you're entering your own journeys, we have a bunch of really, really neat things that are coming down the pipe. And so if you scroll and you can just click on the links in the description below to take to the courses, but we have our study permit course that is up and running. And um, I did my first master class um, at the end of December, but I have got a really, really neat collaboration that I'm doing with Another young YouTuber who uh, I'll just flip over here to her. Let's see if I can find her page. Yes, right here, Rachel. And uh, with uh, canxvisa.com. Um, and I'm going to be um, joining her on Friday evening to talk about study permits and some of the top reasons that these study permits get rejected. So it's going to be over on her channel. And I'm going to do a little bit of a collaboration, which traditionally I haven't. So Head on over to Rachel's channel and subscribe to her channel and then join us. I think it's at 9 p.m. Mountain Time on Friday and there'll be more information that I will share. Uh, and uh, yeah, so she's been she's been providing a lot of uh, good information and help to people who are looking to study in Canada. And uh, so I'm going to be joining her in a live to talk about some of the real challenging aspects of study permits and and the problem areas that people experience when they're trying to submit their study permits. Because, um, yeah, let's just face it, it is something that is not easy, uh, despite what people think. So in my course, my study permit course, I cover a ton of things in this course, and it is a complete walkthrough of the whole process. And whether you're an individual applying, whether you're a consultant who's looking for insight on how to improve your success, I just had this morning um, a consultation 
uh, with uh, an immigration consultant who's starting to see more refusals on her study permits. And so what do you do when there's more refusals on study permits? Well, we go over here and with our legal help on our firm website, refused applications, we have the option of judicial review. Obviously reconsideration is a request, but really judicial reviews is the thing that we, uh, that we help a lot of people with, whether you're, you yourself have had your application rejected or whether you're an immigration consultant and you're starting to see, to see things trend in the wrong direction. We've got a lot of information and instruction on the judicial review process. And, uh, and that is just sometimes what you have to resort to when you're getting refusals. So anyways, long story short, there's lots of options there for people. And if I slide back here one more time, the study permit course, you can roll right now, get access to all those materials, especially those who are looking to try to, to get in for the fall. Now is the time to do it. And uh, we have a spousal sponsorship course for those who are looking to, to sponsor a spouse from abroad. Of course, the express entry course. And uh, we also have an LMIA course for high wage positions. Um, we still have our Quet video course, which is a free course designed to help uh, Ukraine nationals apply for their authorization for emergency travel, that Canada-Ukraine uh, special permit. So all of, this is, uh, all of this is available. So just check it out. It's all there in addition to what we're doing here. So congratulations, Julian. It is so good. So good to see that those things are helping people. All right, um, let's zip through here a little bit more. We've got Nioka who's watching from Toronto. Hello, Nioka. Alpha from Gambia. Great to have you. We've got, oh, of course, Meet Shaw from Scarborough, Ontario. Welcome. And uh, Cantona says, please, which medium can I contact you, sir, please? So lots of times, if you when you're watching this, there's lots of links and instruction in the description of these videos especially in YouTube, Cantona. You can scroll down, you can see how to reach out to us. But for those who are just tuning in and are just watching, um, you'll see here that Holthe Immigration Law is our firm. Uh, that's our law firm. Excuse me. Excuse me. And it's really easy. All you need to do is click on speak to a lawyer and then you can book an immigration consultation with one of the immigration lawyers in the firm. And we do things differently, you guys. When you reach out and you book a consult with us, there's no middle people. Like you work directly with us and we are all immigration lawyers. And um, when you go to about us here at the top of the our website and click on our approach, we talk about our direct lawyer to client collaboration. So we work directly with you and we cut out the middle people. And uh, even if you go through and you, you look at some of the reviews, um, let's see, I'm just trying to think which one, if it was Deborah who had posted it. Um, she said, one thing that I enjoyed, and I just looked at this yesterday, she says uh, in 2021, her PR application got canceled. She found my videos, reached out to the firm. She connected with Alicia, who was available to work with her. And remember, Alicia's got two years more experience than I do. She's got 20 years almost experience working in immigration. But she says here, one thing right here, one thing that I enjoyed working with her is the fact that you communicate directly with her without a person in between. And the other advantage with their approach is that you go through your profile and documents in detail at least twice. Well, often we go through them more times than that. But uh, but yeah, it's just really, we, we love this process. We would hold it up against anyone out there who is representing individuals. We love working with clients. And so um, the best way is just go to our site and click on that link and book a consult and and we can uh, go through your situation and then determine if um, you hiring our firm to help you makes sense. All right. Um, Let's just see here. Good morning to Gurjeet. Hello. And let's see what else we have here. If there's anyone else that we can give some shout outs to. Uh, let's see. We've got Ayesha. Hello to you as well. And okay. All right. So let's go to the top here. And I'm going to uh, identify when you post your questions, what I'd like you to do is make sure that you are putting a cue in front of your question. So that way I'll know that it's a question and, and not just you answering or responding to someone else's uh, inquiries. Sometimes we have people who are sharing insights back and forth. And so, um, yeah, so I absolutely welcome you to post your questions now and we will work through and see if I can tackle. Now, one thing I do want to let you know as we're doing this process is that um, I don't select every question that's asked. And if your question is very specific, in fact, it is just related to your own circumstances, you know, like um, I need to travel outside Canada. Should I travel, Mark? You know, uh, this is my situation. Those types of questions, you will hear me ring my little triangle. And then what will I do? I will direct you right back here to book a consult with our firm. 
because I never ever want to try to give individuals advice when um, in the course of one of these live Q and A's because I just don't have all the facts. And the worst thing in the world, can you imagine what it would be like if, um, if I gave someone advice and said, yeah, go ahead and do it. And then I wasn't aware of some fact and then the person wasn't allowed back into Canada. Well, that's negligent. And so I never want to, to give specific legal advice in the context of this. But when it comes to questions, you know, um, uh, you know, okay, well, let's see here. Let's, let's start right off of the bat and let's, I'll, I'll show you, I'll give you an example of good questions and questions that are more difficult for, for me to answer. So questions like, let's start here. We'll pull one up. Okay. Um, this is a great question from Ibrian. So Ibrian says, when applying for proof of funds, is it necessary to provide proof for both the applicant and their spouse or just the primary applicant? This, this from Ibrian is a wonderful question because anyone who's applying through Express Entry is going to benefit from this. So when applying for proof of funds, is it necessary to provide proof for both the applicant and their spouse or just the primary applicant? Well, the answer is it's just the primary applicant but the key is that the spouse is included within the amount that needs to be demonstrated. So the principal applicant, if they have in one of their bank accounts enough to satisfy the minimum uh, amounts for, for funds, and let's just pull it up here. Let's see. I'm going to pull up the actual page and share it with you guys. So if we slide over here and we look down, you'll see. When it comes to uh, providing proof of funds, yes, if you're required, remember, if you're CEC or you have a job offer, a valid job offer, then you don't need to provide settlement funds. But but for people applying through the Federal Skilled Worker Program without a job offer, yes. And so if you scroll down here, yes, the principal applicant is the one that needs to provide evidence of the funds. So in an account that they have, it could be a joint account with the spouse, but that bank account that meets the requirements of, of what IRCC is looking for, um, as long as the funds are enough to cover however many family members are in that family unit that's being included within the application. And remember, when you're considering proof of funds, it includes anyone that's a dependent, spouse, dependent children, um, and whether they're accompanying you or not to Canada. So you can see, and then they give uh, some good examples here um, as to what they like and what they don't. Obviously, within my Express Entry course, you'll see here that I have a ton of information covering all aspects of the pro process. And if you scroll down to the very bottom, I actually have a breakdown of, of every single lesson, all of the, the instructions, the guides, the individual videos, and mastering documents. I have an entire section that's all based on proof of funds right here with sample documents, sample gift deeds, um, reference letters from banks, all those kinds of things that are all available in the course. And all you have to do is click on the link below and, and you can uh, subscribe to it right now. All right. Okay, good question. So that is a winner, all right? That's a question that we like to see because it benefits everybody that is out there, all right? Okay, let's see who else we have here. Um, We've got a lot of good questions. Let's see if we got one that. Uh... Okay, so this is one. I'm going to go back once again to, to our good friend, Ibrin, and he asked a lot of questions. And that's another thing. I try to spread them out. So if you've asked one, I usually try to hit one of your questions and then move on to someone else. But here's an example of one that probably um, would I would direct with this to book a consult. So Ibrian says, if I and my partner have overstayed our U.S. visa for 10 years, what are the chances of being approved for a work permit with a job offer? Would it be better to apply for express entry instead? So this type of a thing goes right to the heart of Ibrian's situation. I don't know the circumstances around overstaying. I don't know the type of work. I don't know what kind of a job offer is it. Is it LMIA based? I don't even know what Iberian citizenship is. And so all of these questions are all ones that we canvas in the course of our application. Now, often what I'll try to do is to genericize it a little bit. So if someone has overstayed a visa in the U.S., generally speaking, you know, and they've, they've shown that they have not complied with the temporary conditions of their stay, and then they apply for a work permit to Canada, that can be um, something that IRCC looks at when they're determining whether or not to grant temporary stay in Canada. So if you've shown a willingness to overstay and remain without status in one country, IRCC 
the Immigration Department for Canada, Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada, can indeed um, look at that as evidence as to why they should not grant temporary stay in Canada. So in the situation of individuals generically, Ibrian, that are in this, this type of a situation, it's not impossible to apply for a Canadian work permit and get it approved. Um, but the chances are very, very low when you've been out of status in the U.S. for that long. You have to disclose. You can't hide it or misrepresent by omission by failing to disclose it. And when it's on the record, absolutely, it can, it can cause a problem. So would it be better to apply for express entry instead? It may be better to do that if you are eligible to go through express entry. And uh, I've worked with clients in the past who, who have overstayed, who have worked without authorization in the U.S., and they are permanent residents in Canada now. Um, but it's really tough to get a work permit in those types of situations. All right, so there we go. So that's kind of how, we, uh, how I work through these types of questions. And um, generally what I like to do with the questions is to try to be able to answer them in well, I try to keep it in at least a minute. And one of the reasons that I do that, and going forward, one of the reasons that I'm going to do that is to answer questions, and I'm going to just queue it up right now, is because I'm going to put my little uh, my little stopwatch here. The reason that I'm doing that is because some of this content, we're going to start repurposing it for Instagram and for YouTube shorts and things. So we're going to try to keep these questions, uh, questions and answers succinct. All right. Okay. So let's scroll down here and let's see if we can find another great question. And uh, Ibrian, thank you so much for asking those really, really good questions. Um, okay. Let's see. And we've got, oh boy, Ibrian posted a ton, didn't they? Okay. All right. So, uh, so Lima says, how long does it take for medicals to get approved by IRCC? Okay. So let's, let's, let's address this one. So, how long does it take for medicals in the context of CEC, Canadian Experience Class, to get approved by IRCC? Well, when an immigration medical is done, and if there are no issues from the panel physician, the medical gets transmitted electronically to um, headquarters for IRCC, um, the medical branch, and uh, there really isn't anything to approve. It's, it's almost an automatic process for the medical. So really it comes down to how fast the doctor is going to get those results transmitted. So unless there's an issue where there's a concern about medical inadmissibility, it's pretty much an automated process now. So the the actual ability to have it approved is very very low, like the 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 ability to have it approved. When it's approved and there's no issues, the the process and and the timing that it takes to get it approved is um it's very very short. And uh the question then becomes is are, is IRCC going to post it on your your actual um, uh, your 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 like make it visible in your account? So all right, I don't know if this timer trying to answer these questions quick <laughs> is going to be terribly effective. I'll be honest. I'm uh, I'm multitasking here, and that was actually quite hilarious, Lima. <laughs> That's a good question. So I thought, okay, what I'll do is I'll I'll start my timer, and then I'll know I've got one minute to answer the question. Oh my goodness, it is not that easy, you guys. I was totally distracted by the timer when I'm trying to answer. <laughs> okay, well, we'll figure something out, Igor. We'll figure something out. I'm just going to try to keep them shorter, but uh, oh my goodness. Okay, well, anyways, let's let it roll. <laughs> I think you get the answer, Lima. Effectively, medicals, if there's no issues, they get, a pro they, they get approved like almost instantaneously. It's really almost on the end of the panel physician it says, I don't see anything. And then it's like, boom, approved. But actually having it show up on your express entry, your summary page, or on your application where you can see medical is approved, well, sometimes that takes a little bit longer. All right. Ah! <laughs> that is so funny. Oh, my goodness. Minister, help me. Help me. <laughs> Too bad I didn't have the minister. Too bad Minister Fraser wasn't there helping me. And, uh, you know, going, having his phone here and uh, setting the timer. Boom. Okay, I've got one minute to answer this, Minister. Let me know as I'm getting close. <laughs> but that's what I do. I'm a multitasker, you guys. I'm a multitasker. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's get focused again here. All right. Okay, Va says, hello from the biggest and most prosperous black nation in the world. Trust you are doing well. 
Thank you. Well, hey, you got to have national pride. So good for you. Okay. Um, okay, Nisha says, when can an application be made for an open work permit for a dependent? Well, that one, Nisha, is so large and so broad. The only answer I can give is it depends because it depends upon the, the nature of the application for the principal applicant. So um, different programs have different rules and uh, I can't even give you a specific answer to that one. Okay. Um, all right. So Superman says, I'm CEC inland, all passed with security in progress. Is it in-depth security check? I have heard from my friends that their security changed from not started to passed in one day. Okay. Great question, Superman. And the reality is security, uh, it just depends on the country that you're coming from. Canada has, uh, you know, the ability to do background checks for some countries very quickly and others not so quickly. And obviously it relates to the relations that they have with those countries. So how hard is it for, you know, how easy is it for Canada to get a security check and background from Iran? Well, probably it takes a lot longer than if they were going to do it from the U.S. So it depends on your citizenship. All right. Okay, next question here. Let's see who's up. Um, okay. Mendu, this is probably one where I will uh, ring my triangle. Mendu says, I'm applying for a work permit for my wife's open work visa and study visas for our five kids, total seven applicants. However, the online form limits to six applicants, so I'm unable to add last child. This is one you really need to book a consult so that we can sort through it because there are realistic limitations with it, but there's also abilities, and you're probably going through the, the TR portal, I'll bet, um, Mendu, I'll be honest, I don't like that thing. Um, so I recommend you book a consult, slide over to our office right here and uh, click on a link and book a consult and we can chat um, We can chat about the options for dealing with that when you have a larger family because it's a reality, right? It's a reality. Okay, let's see what's next here. Do, 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 do. Let's see. Um <laughs> My friend here, do you want down? Okay, come on, you coming down? Or what are you doing? <laughs> okay, I've got my faithful uh, compadre here uh, who's right next to me and he uh, is trying to knock over my drink. Fortunately, I had the top on. Okay, so, <laughs> so, um, all right, so let's jump back here. Uh, okay, so here's the next question from Yasser. Yasser says, how long does it take to get a response back from an officer after a reconsideration request. Let me give you an example. I had an express entry application that was rejected and they claimed that there was misrepresentation by my client because he had asserted that he was a worker when in fact he was a, a, a self-employed individual. And uh, so the officer found misrep. Well, I requested reconsideration and told IRCC that um, that I politely disagreed with their decision on misrepresentation and, uh, and we sent it back for reconsideration. Well, in the interim, because I never trusted IRCC to actually get back on the reconsideration that quickly, we filed a judicial review application. Um, and the judicial review application was officially uh, approved probably six or seven months later. And it was over a year before my actual reconsideration was was addressed and opened up. So I've had another situation within Express Entry where once again, they refused because they didn't feel the individual had selected the correct knock code. Well, the reality was they'd applied for a work permit, an LMIA based one with the same duties. They had been approved through, the, through Alberta with the same duties. And I politely said to IRCC that well, who was wrong? Was it your first officer who was wrong in terms of the knock code that approved the work permit, the LMIA-based work permit? Was it ESDC who also made the wrong decision? And I said, so if you feel that really this wasn't the right knock code, then you're saying that all the other officers also were wrong. <laughs> so, and in fairness, uh, an immigration consultant had filed the original application and hadn't done a really good job of, of really bolstering the uh, uh, the reference letter. They just used some pretty skeleton duties. But within a week, the person had received their passport request and their application was being finalized. And so it, it's all over the map, all over the map. Okay. Cher says, any chance for high 
480s? Well, maybe, right? If we look at the rounds of invitations and let's take a look at those right now, is, it, is there a chance for, for high 480s? Well, if you look at the rounds of invitations, you can see the last one was 490 and they did 5,500 uh, people were pulled out. And if we look at the previous rounds of invitations, we are on the cusp. So they're working their way down. The only reason this did a big jump is because it was almost a, a month between draws. And then they did two back-to-back -back draws that took it down to 490. I think there's a real, a real chance that it could drop down to 488 or even 489 in the next round of invitations. So stay tuned and I guess we will see if, if that indeed plays out. All right, next question. Let's see here. Um, okay, so this, uh, Gurjeet, this is another example where I'm going to ring my little triangle and strongly encourage you to book a consult. So she says, I got my ITA January the 11th, but my CEC one year will be completed on February the 22nd. I have 60 days to submit my file. Should I accept the ITA and submit the file after February the 22nd or should I decline it? So I will never, ever give anyone um, uh, advice like to make that decision in, in the course of our live Q&As here. So Gurjeet, I highly recommend that you book a consult because I want to look at your situation. I want to see what your score was. I want to see what your situation is, um, your work history, you know, all those factors. I want to see the type of occupation you're in. I want to see, you know, are you, uh, you know, are, are, are you in an individual? Are you single? All those things. So I recommend that you book a consult so that we can sort that out because the last thing in the world I'd want to do is to say, well, your scores are pretty high. So, you know, you're probably going to get another draw. So just decline, wait, and then go with through the pool again. Um, in other cases, I will tell people to wait until after the 22nd, but there are so many things that can go sideways when you're waiting um, and you're leaving it right up to the last moment to file your EAPR. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's I, not something I can give you a direct answer to. Okay. Okay. Jake has a great question here. Jake says, what does it mean to receive a pre-arrival letter after you apply for PR in Canada? Well, the pre-arrival letter is something that IRCC sends out to help people get ready for when they settle in Canada. It is full of a lot of information. It connects you, gives you the ability to connect with the settlement organization that will help to give you advice and direction on how to successfully settle in Canada. That pre-arrival letter usually comes at the very end or very nearing the end stages of your permanent resident processing. Um, and it is, uh, it's a good sign absolutely when you get it. Now, it doesn't mean they can't find something else and, and reject at the last moment, even after a pre-arrival letter has been sent. But it's a letter that just is designed to give you information and instructions on how you're able to uh, more successfully settle in Canada. All right. Okay, uh, let's see. Next question. Okay, let's address Lido's question here. Hi, Mark. If we've been uh, PR'd through nomination of a province, can we buy property in another province with only our family members moving there? Would this not lead to uh, any retraction of PR? As always, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms allows for people to have freedom of mobility. It's a chartered ground. And so individuals can move and live where they want in Canada. But when it comes to permanent residence, and in particular, a nomination from a province, my advice to people is that they make sure that they're actually going to give a shot, give it a good shot to be successful in that province, that they're going to take their skills and their abilities and, and really try to make that province better. That's why the whole PNP system exists, so that provinces can select candidates that they think will come economically establish in that province and make the place a better place to live for everyone else. Um, and so where, whether or not you can own property in another province, well, there's no restrictions on that. I could own a home in British Columbia on Salt Spring Island if I want to. Um, not that I could ever afford that, but I could do that and, and still live here and not have an issue. So it's not a matter of ownership. It's a matter of where you are actually living and making and calling your home. Okay, next one here. This one is uh, Ramit. And Ramit says, my wife received a positive LMIA, but the validity of pre-approved LMIA is the 26th of February, 2023. 
and we are in the pool with 516 CRS. If we got the ITA before expiration, will the LMIA will hold good or it can create any issues. Okay, so Ramit, this is also absolutely one of these consultations. I wanna look at a lot more factors. You say that the validity of the pre-approved LMIA is February the 26th. Is that the date that, that it expires? So you've had it for a very long period of time. I need a whole lot more information, Ramit, before I could give a, a clear answer on that. I recommend that you book a consultation. Okay, um, Soria says, I'm in Canada. I am in Canada on implied status. I got my acknowledgement of receipt yesterday. I've also applied for the 18 month work permit extension, which is still in process. Should I also apply for a bridging open work permit? I don't think that's necessary at this stage. Let the 18 month work permit process. And then once it's approved, um, if, you know, if you need to extend and your PR is not yet approved, you can then use the bridging open work permit to bridge the remaining gap, if any. But hopefully your work permit, your, your, your uh, permanent residence is going to be approved um, before that 18 month work permit expires. Fingers crossed. All right. Um, okay, Sarium has a good question. He says, hey, Mark, I have submitted my full PR application, CEC Inland, last week. I have a change in my employer address from Alberta to Ontario. Do I need to update through web form? Um, there's no harm whatsoever in doing that. Um, what you're really updating is your address, unless you're not moving and you're working virtually. But it does make sense to explain and, and let IRCC know about that change. I'm assuming in the context of your application that you... Um, uh, that you listed your Alberta work as your current employment. So technically, once that changes, it is important to update them. So a simple web form uh, would be fine. I see that you have the same employer though, so I don't know if you're actually relocating, Sarum, but I would notify them. Okay, Mahak asks another question that is really one of these that I recommend you book a consult, but she says, what basis should I have covered if I want to eventually claim common law status for permanent resident sponsorship with my long-term partner? So the most important thing to realize with common law is that you need to be living together for at least one year. IRCC uses the concept of a centralized mode of existence, which basically means that you have your life in common. You have, as an example, maybe joint bank accounts. You're both on the same lease agreement. Utilities are in your name. You have benefits from work that list your spouse as a beneficiary. Maybe uh, you have life insurance that lists them. Maybe you have a will that, you know, that lists them, obviously, as a beneficiary under that will. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different things that you can claim when it comes to common law. Obviously, if your family and friends are also aware, you include that. Sometimes we include the statutory declaration of common law union um, in some instances with some applications. But really, you're showing that you have a life that is in common, just like common law. And uh, you have other external sources that can prove that and establish that. All right. <laughs> Julian says, <clears throat> I was the essential worker. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. I filed in July 8th because of all the docs. Thanks again. Okay. Thanks, Julian, for confirming that. So, Julian, if those of you who are jumping in late... Uh, Julian had actually gone in and uh, I'll just flip my screen around here. This is to my various courses here. She had taken the TR to PR pathway course uh, back in July of 2021. And we were just celebrating her success in, uh, in obtaining, um, yeah, and, and finally reaching the end of her permanent resident journey. So it's great. Thanks for letting us know, Julian. Okay. Let's see what's next here. Um, Okay, Tash, let's try to sort this one out. So he says, I watched one of your videos. You spoke about how even your statement of purpose doesn't guarantee approval. Nope, nothing does, Tash. Um, rather, the Chinook determines your, your fate. It's the way application is submitted. So there is, um, we know that with the, with the TR portal compared to the GC key option, the IRCC secure account, um, they, if you look at the description, and I cover this in length, you guys, in my course, so in my study permit course, I talk about this at length. So um, this is the course right here, and you can log in, you can subscribe to it, 
It has a ton of different information. Actually, I'm going to show you guys. Uh, people sometimes don't appreciate what these courses really are. Well, I guess the question is, do I have it? Um, maybe I don't have it in my actual account. Just give me a second. I'm going to pull this up because I want to show you guys um, the things that I address within the study permit course. And one is the difference in the portal in which you're using to submit your application because it really does make a difference. And one of the things that I cover in my course as I pull it up here, just give me one second. There it is. There is my study permit course. And then we will make it visible there. Okay. All right. So this is my study permit course. And in here, you will see that I have a ton of information as always, background information to get you up to speed. But you'll see here that I talk about the difference between the IRCC secure account versus the IRCC portal. And this is really the TR portal. So this is the portal where individuals, theoretically, it's a more straightforward process for filing your study permit or your visitor application. Um, there isn't forms that you have to up upload. Things are online. <clears throat> but if when you're going through this, and I can't remember if at the end of the video, if I talk about the differences between it, I, I do provide a little bit of uh, a breakdown of it. <clears throat> Let's see here. <clears throat> Okay, I'll just leave that there for now and I'm just going to jump back. So the, the long story short is that when you're looking at the the um, the IRCC portal, that, that new one that they created, embedded within the attestations and authorizations and disclosures and privacy notices, um, that, that if you read the fine print, it shows specifically that they use augmented, you know, adjudication, that artificial intelligence, the Chinook, to process applications. And so when we are submitting applications, they may process it like that, Tosh. But what I have in my toolbox is a judicial review. So in many cases, if an officer decides as they're batching 100 people all at the same time that they're going to refuse all the applications and then check off these generic reasons, often we see that the reasons for refusal sometimes don't even, excuse me, don't even match up with the evidence that we provide it. So they say, you've provided no evidence of, you know, ties to your home country. Well, the statement of purpose is detailed and included in that application. So in those, those circumstances, we will almost always file a judicial review and get it overturned uh, because the officer was just rushing and didn't pay attention. And so that happens a lot. So yes, <clears throat> they zip through things and they don't necessarily look at everything in an application, um, but they have to. And that's where immigration lawyers come in. So you've asked here, can you explain the correlation between Chinook and the statement of purpose for a successful application? Well, the reality is I don't care what Chinook does. I'm going to do everything I can to try to put the key information up front. So I try to put the, 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 the most important factors up front, you know, all of the factors, the, the funds, you know, and even within the course, I break this down in detail. I have um, sample um, uh, study plans and things like that that you can use as a guide. I have a tool to help you build out your own study plan. All of that is contained within the course. But the reality is, I don't care what Chinook is doing. I'm going to load my application with as much information as I can to make sure that if I ever have to go to court and challenge that officer, that they're going to have very little discretion to refuse. So um, Chinook kind of consolidates and, you know, we don't know all of the ins and outs of how this works. We don't even know if they're still using Chinook or whether they've moved on uh, to more um, advanced analytics. But the reality is they use them to, you know, to, to scrape the files for, for specific information and then consolidate it in, you know, kind of like an Excel spreadsheet where they can very quickly look at the different factors and make a decision very, very quickly. When you have hundreds of thousands of applications that you have to go through, there's only so many officers that can do it. And so they try to do this in batches. And when you get batches and you're lumping people together, then what's lost is a, a very, you know, an assessment of the actual facts within a case. So you have to be careful the language that you use when you're filling in your applications. You have to make sure that you're doing everything you can to produce as strong of an application at the first as you possibly can. Sometimes I see representatives <clears throat> who don't do a good job at the beginning and then just expect that whatever IRCC says, they're going to do a better job the second time and refile. Horrible. So 
that's my that's my advice. But any of you who are looking to study in Canada, click on the link below, and I strongly, strongly encourage that you subscribe to the study permit course. I have, uh, you know, there's over 27 lessons for a study permit alone that cover every from everything from the basics, preparing to submit your study permit, um, accessing your online account. I have a whole section on gathering your documents. And in here, you'll see I have a whole section on statements of purpose or study plans. You know, this video alone is 23 minutes just for this, as well as sample documents and our powerful little letter of intent tool that we use when we're uh, when we're completing these applications. So I um, encourage you guys to, to take a look at that if you're looking at studying. Okay, let's see here. We're just about out of time. Um, and I want to get to try to get to uh, a few that have not yet had a chance to get their questions answered. Um, let's see. And I'm trying to find ones that are very good, very open, that will benefit a number of people. Um, okay, this is actually one monsoon that I'm going to bring up and I'm going to talk about. And um, I'm just going to pull this up here. So... See if we can find it here. Okay, so here I'm going to slide this over. So here's the question. So Monsoon says, uh, my sister is 16 now, has profound deafness and can't speak from birth. She can only communicate with ASL and she can say a few sentences in Indian language. How can she immigrate to Canada? IELTS, I am PR. So this, this may not apply to your sister, but I want to make people aware of this. Some people who have learning disabilities have the ability um, to have their language scores averaged for people with a physical or mental disability. So I'll give you an example. I had one of my good, good, he's like a brother to me now in the early days of express entry. Um, he had a learning disability um, and he struggled with language. So he's from Germany. <clears throat> and so what we did was <clears throat> we, we got evidence to provide of the learning disability and they took his, um, his speaking, I believe, and they averaged it. And so you can see here, if you are unable to complete one or more sections of your language test because of a disability, you must use the Comprehensive Ranking Language School, uh, Comprehensive Ranking System Language Calculator tool to find out your score for the abilities you are unable to complete. Input average scores based on those completed. And then, so you can see here, when you click on this, it then takes us here where it's pretty simple. So if you write the CELPIP, for instance, or let's take the IELTS here, and then you say, okay, what I have here is <clears throat> for speaking, I have, um, I've got a seven, we'll say, okay? And then you click on here uh, and you say not tested, not tested, not tested, because this parts are waived. And then when you calculate it, it basically averages what it should be. So in this case, if you had a seven in speaking, it basically gives a CLB 9 for everything else. So remember that when you're doing this, though, there is a very, very specific process you have to go through, including providing evidence to support that, um, that the person really does have a disability. So it could be anything from a, a learning assessment uh, that shows the, 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 the learning you know, disability. Um, we, we had a, an assessment done by a psychologist. We had a ton of other evidence. We obtain permission from the testing centers to have a modified test. And uh, yeah, and that's, that's basically what we did. So it is possible, something that I don't get a lot of opportunities to talk about. But great question, Monsoon. I'm going to give you one of these because many people don't realize that there are pathways. Now, the reality is your sister would still need to meet all of the other requirements if she was applying as a, a skilled worker, including, you know, demonstrating skilled work experience. Um, but as far as other processes through family class options, things like that, um, Monsoon, it really would require uh, a consultation to assess what those other options are. But that was a good, a good opportunity there. Okay, let's see here. What's next? Um, <clears throat> we've got a lot of questions coming through here. Uh, Let's see, what is the best one? We'll go a couple more and then we'll wrap up for today. Okay, I'll address Anya's question here, which is really painful for a lot of people. So she just got two days ago her ECOPER 
Just checked the processing times for getting your first PR card. It showed 180 days. Can you get PR card earlier than that? I'm just curious. Anya, unless you have some highly exceptional circumstance, um, they you are stuck. It's horrible. This is something that I would ask the minister. Where are the priorities? What is important? Personally, I think individuals that have obtained their permanent residence, received their ECOPR, should not have to wait 180 days to receive their PR card. But unless you have uh, a situation where there's a, a, an emergency, and even in those cases, they'll say, well, go and apply for a, a permanent resident travel document to come back to Canada. But yeah, this is a situation that many people are in, and it is very, very difficult to ever be able to, to, to get them to process a PR card earlier. It's just a mess. It really is. Okay. Um, all right. So this is a good question. Okay. So this question is from uh, Aluremi. And he says, does someone on a post-grad work permit um, need an LMIA to claim points for a job offer while applying for CEC or FSW? Thank you. And the short answer is yes, and I will show you why. So I should be able to pull this up quick. Yes, we'll slide over here to the screen. So here's the instructions. So yes, you need an employer who's willing to give you a job offer and it needs to have all of these things here. Um, but you'll see here, when it comes to breaking down for CEC, this second part is the kicker. So it also must have been, this is a permanent LMIA that supports PR. This one is a regular LMIA that's skilled, or it needs to be a work permit that if it's not LMIA based, it's still employer specific, and uh, you would have had to work for a year. So this is, a, this is under the International <coughs> Mobility Program. So no, <coughs> a generic open post-grad work permit uh, will not work, that you would need to shift to an LMIA? Great question. Thanks, Olu. All right, let's see who is next here. To hear over on Facebook, good to have you. Thanks for connecting in. All right, let's see here if we can find another good one uh, that works. Let's see. <laughs> he says, it's all about your videos. Thank you, my friend. All right, let's see what we have here. Um, Okay, so Raul says, I have a valid LMIA exempt closed work permit with NOC 21222, but I have three and a half years of foreign experience and a different NOC. So which NOC should be my primary NOC? That 100% is one of these right here. Um, the primary NOC is the one that you have your work experience in. So ultimately, it doesn't make a big difference. If you're in Canada, um, I'm just looking here, valid LMIA exempt closed work permit with NOC, but I have three and a half years of foreign experience and this other NOC. So remember when it comes to the Canadian experience class, you're counting the work experience that you've obtained in Canada. So you need at least one year in the previous three years as part of it, as well as the minimum language amount. If you're qualifying through the federal skilled worker program outside of Canada and you're applying through that, then you need to have that one year of continuous paid full-time work experience in at least a tier three or higher under the NOC 2021. And so which one you choose as your primary NOC, it doesn't matter, but it needs to, that primary NOC needs to be able to, to demonstrate that you qualify for the program. One other little piece of advice, remember that for Canadian experience class, you don't need to claim all of that one year of work experience in the same NOC, as long as it's tier three or higher. All right, good question, Raul, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, let's answer this one from Zaya. Is there an issue living in Ontario and working remotely under a Quebec work permit? <laughs> it depends on what, are, are you talking about express entry? Um, if, if the answer is express entry, well, no. You can, uh, you know, you, the, the key is that you're demonstrating an intention to economically establish um, and, and well, really, you're demonstrating an intention to reside outside the province of Quebec for the purposes of, um, of express entry. For the purposes of, say, Ontario, if you're going through that program, well, it'd be pretty hard to, to qualify through the ONIP, uh, OINP, if the employer was not based in Ontario. So I think ultimately it just comes down to um, uh, which per PR program you're going through. If it's express entry, then there's no hard and fast rule that says, you know, you can't work um, remotely for a Quebec company, but live in Ontario. But the more evidence you can show that you intend to live outside, the better. 
All right. Uh, let's see here if there's any more. If there's any others that we have missed. There's a lot of questions, and I know that we're zipping through this pretty quick. Um, Yasser says, thanks so much for explaining my question. You're very, very welcome. Okay, Safwan, we'll end off with Safwan here. He says, how long I have CEC eligibility? So it's pretty simple. When you apply for the Canadian Experience class, you need to show that you've had one year of full-time paid experience in the previous three years. So the moment that one year drops outside of a three-year window. So if the start date of your work that you're claiming is older than three years and it starts to drop off and you only have one year, then at that stage, you're no longer going to be eligible for CEC. You don't have to live in Canada even. You could go home as long as that one-year work experience was, was there within the previous three years at the time in which you submitted your application. All right. Okay, everybody, thank you so much. We have another good live Q&A today. It was great to have all of you here. I see there's a ton of other questions here that I didn't get to. Remember, we'll be back tomorrow, Alicia and I, with another live. And um, remember, as always, you guys, that everything that we do here, at least today, uh, within the, the, um, uh, the, the current world we're in, um, Holthy Immigration Law, my law firm, is the sponsor of the Canadian Immigration Institute Live Express Entry Q&A. So any questions that you have uh, that we answer here, I try to make them in a way that will benefit as many people as possible. If you have something specific, well, hire us. Come over to our firm. You can take a look at everything. Look at our rating. Anyone who has a five rating, well, there's probably, it's, it's a lie because no one's going to have a 5.0 rating because sometimes I tell clients things they don't want to hear and um, they don't like the advice because I tell them you can't lie. You can't cheat on your application. Yes, you have to disclose something. Sometimes people don't like to hear that. But you can see, generally speaking, our firm is still, like I've worked and practiced Alicia and I for over 20 years. Um, but in December uh, of 2019 is when I started the firm from scratch. And we started doing this, I think about a, oh, how long did we start keeping track of this? Maybe about a year we've been doing this. And so we've had a lot of our clients that have been piling in to give us uh, the ratings that we, that we enjoy. And we work really hard for them. And so we'd love to work with you. You can go to the website, Holthy Immigration Law. It's just holthylaw.com. And the links are all in the description below and in the video that you're watching. You can connect in, learn more about our firm, learn about the services that we offer, visiting, working, studying, immigrating, and absolutely check out the blog posts. So those of you who are looking to study, Chanel just did an, an awesome little post on how to, uh, how to increase your chances of study in Canada in 2023. So definitely check that out. And then we will also be doing another video. Um, I'm going to be releasing that shortly that condenses the breakdown that I gave with my live. Let me just see if I can find it here. So ch definitely check out TR to PR refusal good news with Cedric. Um, I did a live. I think I have to go to live here probably. Yes. Okay. So uh, immigration right here. Oh yeah, mistake. And then the 2.0, this one. So I'm going to do, I'm going to revise this one and make it just a little bit more concise and pull out 10 takeaways from this, uh, this new express entry system that I believe are going to happen. So make sure that if you haven't subscribed to the channel, check out all the content that you have. And um, yeah, it's, uh, there, there's just a ton of things that are happening. I also want to remind you guys again, as I slide over here, uh, let's see if I can find it here. Um, remember that I'm going to be going live on Friday. If you're, if you, I don't know if you follow Rachel's channel, uh, Rachel Dansel, but um, uh, it's at RR Dansel is her YouTube channel. I'm going to be joining her to talk about some of the most common problem areas with study permit applications. And we're going to be doing that live on her channel here. Um, uh, it'll be Friday. So let's see today. It'll be the 27th at I think 9 p.m. Mountain Time. So she posts a new video every week at 8 p.m. PST. Well, uh, on Friday, we're going to have a live there on her channel. So go check that out. All right. Looking forward to collaborate with, uh, with someone else. So thanks so much, everybody. I appreciate you all connecting in. It was great to have you here. Uh, Alicia and I will be back tomorrow. And uh, we'll be doing another live right around noon. So take care, everybody. Have a wonderful Wednesday evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you're watching in the world. Take care.